ladies and gentlemen, the national anthem of the newly formed Udirua Nation. <laughs> Very good afternoon to everyone joining me this afternoon. My name remains Adi Thomas from Heritage Television in London. Thank you for joining us again. Uh, we are not in any mission apart from getting the right information across to you, letting you realize the importance of what we're doing, what you are doing, what I am doing, what everyone is doing. The people outside protesting, what is the situation? Why they're doing it? Why they're doing it? And why they're doing it? No, any other reason. These are our aim at Heritage Television, and I believe sincerely this is the aim for everyone that has been crying wolf, making noise, and crying truth as well on all the channels that were operating this thing on. I want to say a very good afternoon, a very good morning, a very good evening, whatever time you are on, wherever you are listening to me this afternoon. Today is another day. We had a program in the morning. There's another one coming on. And we're still going to have another one in the evening. Now is the time. Because the end is very near. Three times a day. Every day. Until we get to where we're going to. And I'm sure it won't be long. Before we actually get there. I'm going to leave you with a video quickly. Because there's some few things we want to talk about today. And uh, what we want to talk about in essence is. Wrong politics. Leads to wrong policies and it leads to big policy issues so i welcome you once again if you have not already subscribed to this channel please do so as soon as you can because it will help my work it will help your work it will help what every one of us are doing and when you when you click the subscribe button please click the notification button as well and for your information this program, you need to share it. You need to share it. Please, I'm begging you, my, 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 my brothers and sisters, uh, you need to share it. It's on Twitter, it's on Periscope, it's on YouTube, it's on uh, Facebook, it's on our app, it's on our website as well. So there's no excuse that, oh, I didn't see it. You can't tell me you can see it. The only thing that I saw it, but I didn't want to have a look at it. What's the point? Okay, let's go for it. Should we watch the video first before I introduce my guest or should I introduce my guest? Maybe we, should, we need to 
to to turn it toast the coin <laughs> you're joking we're not gonna toast the coin now let's just bring my guest in so that you can see this knowledgeable man who has been to various parts of the world and done various things in his life and he wants to share his wisdom his experience with us good afternoon sir mr kwasi ola tibosu how are you doing sir I'm fine. Good afternoon. It's been a pleasure uh, 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 being with you this afternoon. I wouldn't say a pleasure. I would be, it's an honor. It's a privilege for me to be speaking to a very busy man like you on the program today, sir. It, it's a pleasure. It's a pleasure. Um, you, you, one cannot be too busy for our, for our land. You know? Okay, that's true. That's true. Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, later on today, uh, well, I believe I'll be having Saeed Oshupa on the show. So if you're watching me, I believe in court. Believe, unquote. I'm not 100% confirmed yet, but I'm sure it won't be too busy for us at that time. Could you please introduce yourself to my audience? Let them know who you are, sir. Yeah, um, my, my, my name is uh, Dr. Posiola Tuboson. Uh, I'm an academic in the UK. Uh, I've been um, involved in teaching, and now, basically, more of research now. Um, and uh, this is in the area of uh, accounting and finance. Uh, my background is accounting, as you would imagine. Um, I, I've, been in, I've been in accounting practice and then into stockbroking and, and now into, into academics. I've, I've been in academics in the UK since 2008. Um, and that's what I do. I, I research uh, policies, uh, policy development. I mean, into government, in the, that uh, the right things are done, uh, so that it can lead to the right thing for the people. That's what I do. Um, well, I, I've, I've been to a few of uh, universities. I've worked in a few of a few universities. I've been. Uh, I worked in Henley Business School. Uh, 2015 to 2018, and I recently was in the University of East London. I left there as the director of the Tax and Accountancy Clinic, and uh, during the you know the COVID crisis, we helped uh, the community in East London, especially on um, things that has to do with uh, you know filing their tax returns, coping you know getting government palliatives uh, during the crisis. And now I'm the head of the accounting and finance department at the University of West Coast and London campus. So that's what I do at the moment. And of course, uh, in doing so as an academic, I'm deeply into uh, research as it relates to corporate governance. And that is what is tangential with um, Odudua Republic, or what I would say, Yoruba, Yoruba nation. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. I really appreciate that, sir, for the full description of you, who you are. And I'm sure my audience will be very happy with what you've said to us. Quick question. Policies and politics. They both start with P, but they're very interwoven, very connected. A good politics leads to a good policy. A wrong policy politics leads to a wrong policy. Can a wrong policy leads to a wrong, a bad politics. Let's start from there. Thank you. You, you, you got it right there. Um, and the best analogy is, uh, you know, what's, you know, in political economy, what people normally uh, discuss, which is the egg and the hen, which one came first. So politics and economy, which one comes first? Uh, the, the truth is, the two of them are interwoven, but you cannot get good policies without good politics. Take, for instance, uh, look at uh, many of the African countries. Uh, the system of governance given to us is a representative one, that is parliamentary system. And parliamentary system is quite, you know, you, you know, you you feel like everyone is within that gov kind of government. That is, whether you are the opposing party, whether you are the party in power, you're all in it together. So it's kind of participative. So 
Uh, but then over the years, I think because of dictatorship, uh, that kind of uh, governance uh, was waved aside. But then it, it, a research was carried out recently, I don't know by who, uh, which showed that there's actually a positive correlation between the presidential system of governance and corruption. Okay, the only place on earth where well, the, the presidential system came from the US, but um, it is actually kind of alien to to the African setting. You know, uh, the president can actually be deaf and dumb, uh, decide not to listen to what the people say, but where it is truly representative, I choose that carefully, that is where the population reflects the people that uh, represent them not the, the the kind of uh, um you know the, the the one in the first republic where half of them came from the northern part whereas the the, the south represent two third in reality but where the uh the people the the, the govern the the, the, the the government uh you know represents the true you know uh, represents the people then you expect that there will be some kind of negotiation and you know whatever policies that come out will reflect will truly reflect the yearnings of the people so um so truly where policies are developed not out of consideration for the people then un unfortunately the people suffer so for instance uh before you create schools before you create hospitals before you create uh you know police posts and so on and so forth it is believed that you would normally consider the uh the, the population so when that is what when that is distorted obviously it affects uh well you will come up with negative policies and the people suffer for it so you, you can now see that uh, if you get the wrong politics, okay, so if it is the kind of the, the wrong kind of governance system, whereby um, in, in four years, you know, you cannot question the person, they'll say, okay, I've gotten the mandate, and then bye bye to the people, that's not governance. In a parliamentary system, if three times you present a, a, um, a bill, and it is turned down, then there will be vote of no confidence on that government. They will have to leave, and then there will be another general election. So, so you can now see that um, they would, you know, they would be compelled to do the bidding of the people. So there is a struggle, therefore, between you know governance, uh, the politics, and the policies. And if it goes wrong, unfortunately, the people suffer. Okay, thank you very much, yeah? So, everything is interwoven, right? In Nigeria situation, when we're trying to get independent, is that where we get it wrong? We didn't have the right policies laid down? And whose fault? How can we correct it? How can we move forward? <sighs> it's a three-in-one question. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes, yes. So how can we how can we get it right? No, we, we need to find out how it happens, when it happens, what can we do about it to get it right? To put it back. It's wrong already. Yeah. So, so let, let's start with uh how it happened. Well, the, the I must say, you know, with benefit of hindsight, looking at the the constitution given to us, it wasn't a perfect one, the 1960 constitution. But if you look at the 1963 Commission, then you would say, well, it seems like we actually got it right. And I must say, you see, if you ask people who, you know, experts in political science, they will tell you that that 1963 Constitution is one of the best constitutions ever produced anywhere in the world. And in fact, that Constitution was copied by Canada. You know, the federal system of governance being used in Canada today was uh, a replica, a doppelganger of the 1963 constitution. But let me also say that uh, you know, th that constitution showed that there is not the, 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 that what we call the Federal Republic of Nigeria 
actually doesn't exist on its own. It only exists because of the federating units. So we had the West, the Midwest, which was created in 1962, the East, and the North. So it is the conglomeration of all this that became what we call the federal constitution. So which means that um, without them, we don't have a, a country. Now, at, still addressing your question of how it happened, that was a fantastic constitution because, um, you know, the, each of the uh, federating units were actually competitive. They had everything, you know, within the regions they can, they have, they have, they can create police, they can create uh, local governments. They've got all the powers. You know, so the, the federal was not only there for defense, for currency, uh, for foreign policies. So that was uh, a, um, a kind of constitution that uh, rightly so, the uh, founding fathers subscribed to. So I wouldn't, um, you know, with benefit of hindsight, I wouldn't say they, they took the wrong step by going into a federation with, uh, with the North, with the East and the Midwest. Not at all. It, it was it, it was a perfect, uh, and in fact, it also gave opportunity for any of the federating units to, you know, true plebiscite decide to leave the federation. That's what it should be. And then by 1966, that was jettisoned. So now, whose fault? Now, over the years, um, and I think you see, looking at what happened between 1966 and 1967, whereby the leader of the Yoruba was in jail. Uh, you know, it was released by Go on and, uh, you know, because it would have been the perfect time to pull out of that federation. But so, uh, but then the Yorubas decided not to. Uh, and then, you know, the East uh, that decided to leave was punished. Um, so it, I think, I think at that time, it was at that time that, um, you know, in law, they said defeat, the delay defeat equity. I think it's at that time that um, each of the regions should have gone their way. But then, um, unfortunately, because they didn't, uh, all the acts that had happened between then and now show that we've actually ratified everything uh, which the military, which the you know second report, all those uh, um, uh, creation of state and so on and so forth, were effectively ratified. That's what it means. But how can we get it right? We've got, um, you know, options before us. We've got, and we can only think about um, uh, models that had been used in the past. We've got the Russia uh, option, which is that look, the the president of the federation can actually say, "Well, I'm dissolving this," or it can be. Uh, you know, the Czechoslovakia option, whereby the two countries that made up the union decided that, look, let us go our separate ways peacefully, or the Yugoslavia option, whereby it, it ended up a nasty way, unfortunately. So these are the options before us right now. Uh, some people have said that the that Nigeria actually came to an end, 31st December 20, 2013. I think uh, my friend Barrister Tony Nadi also subscribed to that point of view. Well, I'm not a solicitor, I'm not a barrister, I cannot really say, but uh, if that is to be pursued, I think it should, it should be pursued in court, obviously not in Nigerian court, which is made up of, uh, <laughs> uh, um, you know, uh, Charia uh, compliant uh, fellows, people who are not actually qualified, who are not supposed to be there. This is mm -hmm. a country, I must say, which was hitherto led, the, 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 the Supreme Court was hitherto led by Professor Taslim Elias, somebody who has PhD from University of London, I think it was at Cambridge at the time. He was also at, at that time <laughs> the dean of the Faculty of Law at the University of Lagos. Now, we're now having a Sharia compliant person leading that. So, but it can be pursued in court, I believe, outside uh, in, the, uh, in, the, in the international arena. But in the absence of that, um, I think the, the other options uh, would be to consider the, you know, the Czechoslovakia option or the Yugoslavia, Yugoslavia option. But the truth is, Nigeria, the way it is, is coming to what I would call cul de sac, unfortunately. I like your language there, cul de sac. It's yeah, coming to they, a dead end. 
yes, you don't yes. know what called this sack means. I want to say a very big thank you for joining us this afternoon. If you are just joining us, I have Dr. Wasiola Tubosu, who we've been deliberating and discussing about wrong politics will definitely take you to wrong policies. And that is where we are today. During this protest, during these uh, youth protest, because they said the youth can change anything. They have the energy, they have the power, they have the willpower. This is not a protest anymore. This is probably coming something else. Something that we see about 20 something years ago in Hong Kong. Do you see it like that by any chance, Doctor? Yeah. Um, um, actually, um, this protest um, may, you know, may, may turn nasty, God forbid. Uh, but, um, but let us look at what they are actually asking for. They're asking for, you know, uh, end to SARS and to um you know a, a federal you know a centralized police system uh that's what they're asking for you know in another way but what, what, what they're actually asking what they're saying well we, we, we want end to police brutality but let us look at the root of this um in other countries well in in the, in the united kingdom where where you know where i'm currently domiciled you know the police is a residual issue. It is something that holds in the local government, and that was the kind of, you know, constitution that we had uh, at, at at independence. Police, it, it, look, crime is a local issue. Crimes are localized. You cannot have a, a kind of police which would be in the central uh, central government, which will now dictate to them at the local level. That that doesn't make any sense at all. Um, in, in London, for instance, in the whole of the, I think, 16 or so uh, local councils in London, we have what's called London Met, Met Police. Uh, well, that makes sense anyway, because it's a, it's a metropolitan area. But then once you go out to Bedford or to Hertfordshire, they've got their own police. They used to have the Bedfordshire one, but I think because of the fact that they, they, they're coming uh, in the lower rung in the in the league table, they had to match with Hertfordshire police. Uh, in... in um, in, in Reading, they have the Thames Valley Police. In Essex, they have Essex Police. I mean, the, that is what it should be. That, that's what uh, po policing uh, should be. So when you look at um, um, the, 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 police, the policing system in Nigeria, whereby we have uh, Inspector General of Police in, in Abuja dictating to people at the lower level, uh, that is, unfortunately, that is not... Uh, what policing should be. They got it actually wrong. And they're not in any process of you know, repairing that. I read something in the papers, in Nigerian papers, uh, I think this week, where the Inspector General of Police is saying that they are in the process of building even more barracks. Can you believe that? In 2020, building barracks, not for the army, for the police, so that the police can be <laughs> further alienated from the people. So we're not getting it right at all. Now, in terms of um, where this could lead to, well, um, one can only hazard guesses, I'm, I must say. But if it continues for a long time, it may, well, the, it seems like the, in the legitimacy of, you know, what they call the Federal Republic of Nigeria, but I call it the Fulani Republic of Nigeria. The integrity of that country is being called to question now. And if it continues, then the, um, the other variables may join into the frame, which may not, we haven't thought about now. And then it, it may, you know, totally get out of hand. So, um, one can compare this to what happened in Egypt. What happened to in Egypt did not actually end well, unfortunately, because it, it tilted into military rule. Uh, God forbid that uh, the Fulani Republic of Nigeria will also fall into military rule now because it will further put people into servitude, continue uh, the uh, lordship of the north over the south, uh, and you know further aggravate the, you know, uh, poverty in the land. So where this would lead to, actually one can only hazard guesses, as I've said. Okay. 
Should we have a look at this quickly? Let's have a look at this. This is a policy that, this is a politics that produced something like this. Let's have a look at it. Wow, that was very, very brief, but it speaks volumes. These are youth on the street, and sometimes they can be adamant, even in the face of gone. They might not go away. So unless there's a quick change, unless something happens quickly, what do you think this will lead to? Because we need to talk about this before we start going to uh, oil and gas and all the other things that we want to talk about about initially well you and i know that uh, the people have been pushed to the wall uh, now we, we, we like heard, see it. <laughs> yeah i mean 88 uh, uh, the last count i think two years ago 88 million people are uh, below poverty line in nigeria and poverty means that they earn less than a dollar a day now that figure I think, has increased to a hundred million, about half of the population of that country. You see, when I was growing up, uh, whenever you hear that somebody is poor, well, we're talking of the, the early 80s, when if you see someone begging for arms on the street, surely that person is not a Yoruba person. Not at all. It doesn't happen at all in Yoruba land that somebody will be begging for arms. <laughs> but, but what do we have now? So then, if somebody is begging for arms, you will say, Alabama, sir. Of course, you know what I'm talking about. But then, he, now, we have free-born Yoruba people. Because here, we believe that, you know, you need to work. Does it mean you, you went to school up to a point, uh, if you cannot go any further? But there, are, there are certain things you can do. You, you go to learn a trade or a profession or a vocation. You will be articled to a trade. Uh, nowadays, you don't get this kind of things anymore. I have an uncle uh, who is a tailor. He he, he used to get um, people who who uh, uh, article to uh, you know to learn tailoring, but Apprentice. but no longer. People want to ride, people want to ride okada. But then now, what I'm trying to say is that all those opportunities have dried up. So there there is nowhere again to go. If people uh, are rich, if they've got some money in their pocket, if they are middle class, you know, perhaps they could say, well, don't, don't go out and so on. But now, the truth is, there's nowhere to go. You know, whether it's, uh, we're, we're talking of, um, you know, free-born Southerners, you know, they, they, when they learn any trade or whatever, I mean, the, the system is even choking them. You know, even if you have innovative ideas, there are, you know, government policies that are out to kill you. There are taxes, there are multiple taxes and so on and so forth uh, that are out to, 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 to destroy you. So it seems like the people are reconstituted here. They, they have nowhere to go. So they would continue to be on the street. Now, I think this has been also been aggravated by the fact that the children of the poor are at home. They are not in school, of course. The, the children of the rich are in, in uh, the private universities. You know that's the the how the society has been bifurcated over the years. So, uh, you know, it is part of the government policy that is keeping them at home. So, what 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 do you expect? They would continue to protest, and, and I, I tell you, these things that they are protesting for, they are live issues. They are issues that are happening now. My wife just told me of. Um, uh, what happened to a, a friend? In fact, you know, I also heard from the friend that uh, SAS stopped them. They want to buy. They wanted to buy something uh, in Lagos, very near University of Lagos. You know, they were told to pack, and then uh, you know they said that uh, they they may allege that they are armed robbers if they 
refused to pay them 20, 000, um, an amount of money. But at the end of the day, they settled for 20,000 Naira. So these issues are real. These are people in the middle class. So there are people who are, unfortunately, they have become dregs. There's nowhere for them to go. They've been pushed to the wall. Remember, there is COVID before now. For six months, many of them aren't working. Monies are not coming in. So they've been, I mean, he had fallen. Fears no fall. So there is nowhere to go. And that is what is feeling this. Remember during the COVID period, also the issue of, um, you know, all this um, uh, antisocial behavior increase whereby people were being attacked in their houses, uh, money has been taken off them and so on. So, and the jobs are not being created. And for people who want to create jobs, the environment is stifling them. So this is something that will not go off easily. They, they, okay, so if government says, okay, well, we're going to, we're quelling this perhaps by, uh, you know, agreeing to their demand, the, the root cause of these issues are still there. And unfortunately, until this is addressed, uh, we, we may be in for a rough ride. Okay, thank you. We may be in for a rough ride. A rough ride indeed. Well, I don't think we may be in for a rough ride. I think we're into rough ride already because there's some few things that is burning issues up. Uh, let's go back to our real agenda, how we want to tread, tread, uh, the, tread, tread the veg before. But before we go there, Nigeria economy cannot take care of senators and the expensive presidential system of government. That's a policy. And they're paying these guys. In, they, they, they analyze that in different parts of the world, this is the salary of their, of their team. And in Nigeria, in the United K uh, States, uh, a senator annual salary is $174,000. A, a, a senator. In Nigeria, this is the deal. The bell is ringing. The bell is ringing. It's $2 million. 2 million. Yeah, $2.16 million. Correct. Wow. <laughs> yes. And Unbelievable. Some of them go there to sleep. Hmm. Some of them comes there and said, I have four wives. <laughs> now, that's the issue. Now, you see, this is certainly unsustainable. No. I, the, um, every year, the local government here, where I stay, they, they send me the account, kind of account. You know, it, it, that's part of the stewardship that we enjoy in this part of the world. So in that document, it tells me that for every hundred pounds that I pay in council tax, this is how it is spent. And what is intriguing is that two percentage, listen to this carefully, two pounds out of every hundred pounds is spent on administration. Okay, mm -hmm. on administration. And the same thing is replicated at Westminster. So um, um, civil servants, you know, paying for MPs, paying for anything at all that has to do with administration takes not more than two percentage of the budget. So they can have time to, uh, you know, resources to be plowed back into transportation, into housing, into unemployment benefit and so on. So in my council alone, I think about 40% or so is spent on, you know, unemployment benefit, care for the elderly and so on, uh, on education. So that is what it should be. <laughs> so uh, I remember when the former uh, governor of uh, Central Bank, um, you know, uh, in full anime, I'm going to be talking about what he, you know, how he destroyed the banking system, if time permits. He said that 25% of the recurrent budget, that is 25% of all the operating expenses is spent on maintaining the uh, National House of Assembly. One quarter of all the operating expenses spent on uh, 469 people, that is um, 360, 360 House of Rep members and 109 uh, Senate members. So the question therefore is, is this fit for purpose? Uh, why should they tell the wagging the dog? 
are rules made for human beings or or are, are we made, made for, for the rules? So, so, so we start asking that question. And in in Senegal, in, in, at the beginning of this, um, I think around two thousand something, I remember that they were patriotic enough to say, "Look, we don't need bicameral legislature, le legislature," and and therefore they reduced it to to just one. So, but but <laughs> the case of Nigeria is much more than that. Look. There is need for surgical operation. That we don't need bicameral legislature. That's one. Then um, we also don't need a presidential system of governance. As I've said to you, there is a positive correlation between uh, presidential system of governance and corruption. Mm. Look at Ethiopia. Look at Botswana. Any look at Namibia. Any any society where they have parliamentary system of governance, they are likely to do the bidding of the people. It's simple. Think about it. If there is, uh, if there is maybe a town, you know, or uh, maybe a subset of a town, and you are representing them, you're living in that community. So, if they they can always tell you what they wanted, but in the case of Nigeria, think about it. Is it actually fit for purpose? The answer is no. We have two sets of um, uh, lawmakers. You know, the upper house, the lower house. And even when they've done their job, they approach the executive, the executive can simply just turn it down, as oh. it happened uh, shortly before the uh, last general election, when the, the representative of the people said, well, what we actually wanted is electronic voting system. And the president, in his own wisdom, said, no, I don't want that. OK? And you know, he wasted time and ensured that that didn't come to pass. Um, in the same uh, House of Assembly, uh, some legislatures, I think 60-something of them, had said, look, let us go back to parliamentary system. It was also turned down. So um, the, 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 the truth is that the, if you, and, the, and then if you look at, you see, in, in, in public sector like this, we look at effectiveness, the, the measures of effectiveness. Look at the number of bills being churned out number of them that became an act of parliament later on. And you, what, what you will come up with is that, uh, unfortunately, it seems like that body, that you know, uh, National House of Assembly, isn't fit for purpose. And then if they are earning $2.16 million a year, the, the, the question is, OK, how much, is, how much are the people on the street earning? I listened to an interview. I don't know whether you've watched this. So the, an interview with uh, a, a Nigerian descent uh, police officer in Canada. Uh, the, the interview was done with Dili Momodri. And this guy was saying, well, as a police sergeant in United uh, in Canada, he earns 100,000 Canadian dollars. And that his own mayor earns less than him. That is what it should be. Okay, the chief executive of my local council here, I think, earns something like one hundred seventy-six thousand. But I must say that that chief executive isn't elected, and I think, well, that, that's discussion for another day. The local governance system, perhaps you you can you can advertise a position and then give it to you know people who are highly qualified, and then the the councillor can represent the people. So so that's what operates in the UK. The the local government are headed by chief executive officers who are professionals, OK? And as, as a professional, you know, I earn more than my MP. I tell you, what I earn uh, as, as, um, as a, a, a university uh, uh, lecturer is more than what my MP earns, you know? But, but is that the case? So when we have 2.16 million being paid to an MP in Nigeria, so the question is how much is a professor earning in Nigeria? I understand that the <laughs> earning professor, professor in Nigeria earns 5 million naira a year, which is 10,000 pounds. That's very, very disgraceful, you know? Hmm. Disgraceful. I don't, I don't want to even go into that. So 2.16 million. So what kind of development will take place in that kind of economy? OK? Uh, this is a country with 16 million people out of school. 
So what do you think they're going to become in the future? Astronauts? Uh, medical consultants? Gynecologists? What do you think they're going to become? Surely yes. Nigeria will become a basket case and they will become net exporter of violence in West Africa. That's what they will become. So mm. um, this 2.16 million <laughs> is even nauseating, thinking about it. You know, so um, but, but the question is, how did we even get to this kind of situation? Yeah. Um, the, the system cannot correct itself, unfortunately. And I think it is time instead of doing uh, protests such as, such as revolution now and SARS now, what should happen? What should trend is end Nigeria now. No. It is no longer for purpose at all. It only exists for a few. Perhaps four percentage. The last time I checked, I think four percentage of the population controls the whole wealth of the country. Compared to a country like this, where um, people who we consider poor are people who earn less than twelve thousand five hundred pounds, and uh, people who earn more than seventy thousand pounds are um, one percentage of the population. One percentage. So most of the people earn between 12,500 and 60,000 pounds. So, so everyone is in the middle class. But in this kind of situation where the, the middle class, well, if, if 80 something million people or 100 million people are in poverty, okay, and very few, I can bet it, but, you know, the, the, the percentage in the middle class in Nigeria surely cannot, cannot be more than 10 percentage. And then we have very few, very rich. We have, you know, very poor. And then we have people who are in 2.16 million, where we have deficit in roads, in uh, infrastructure. It is, it isn't sustainable. But we've said it, and people have said it, and people in power know this for sure. And nothing is happening. And that's why I'm saying that. Look, uh, you see, we cannot run. Um, you know, people who are not related in any way. You cannot all, you know. You, you cannot herd the cat, as you would as we would say. Uh, the, the West, the East, the North, we are not the same in any way. Uh, so, the, 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 for instance, in the West, we have a traditional ruler system, but then it doesn't stifle uh, our, our, our innovative practice. In the East, they are Republican in nature. In the North, they, they, they want to practice their feudalism. So, if you now want to you know, bring all of us together and then, you know, make us to uh, exist as a country, I don't think it's going to work. So uh, coming back to this 2.16 million, unfortunately, it's going to continue like that. Nobody's going to reform the system until we dismantle the system. So the solution, in essence, is dismantle, dismantle, dismantle. There is no other thing to do now, I'm afraid. Um, it, 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 okay, so we look, I, I've worked in private organizations. If anything is going wrong, you see, it, it, see we, we only need to wait for 30 days. By, by the end of the month, you're going to be, you know, asking questions, make the per, per person face panel and so on and so forth. But then we have been talking about these issues for a very long time and nothing is changing. People who are supposed to change it aren't interested. Uh, so what then is going to happen? As I've said before, are, are, are we created for rules or rules created for us? As a society, we are supposed to say, okay, this is how we want to live our lives. And then we abide by it. Okay. This country uh, at some point decided that, look, we don't want to become, we, we don't want to continually remain part of the EU. And that was exactly what happened. So if uh, the people have been pushed to, you see, all the ingredients are now present. Over the years, people who want to go to school, they cannot go to school. You are creating, you know, um, people who cannot go to school in the West, which is almost like an abomination before. Okay, now they're in poverty, they're helpless. Okay, so what then do you expect them to do? You are creating uh, uh, um, an army of ready hands for, you know, uh, antisocial activities so you know by, by the time you know they now carry arms against the state see all these things that you're finding uh, kidnapping in the in, in in the east 
armed robbery in the West now kidnapping at, at, at in added to it, um, Boko Haram in the North. These are all evidences of a failed system, which isn't working, which isn't uh, in the, in anyone's interest. The only place now in that in that uh, contraption that you can say has some element of you know semblance of um, um, you know things going normally is still the western part of Nigeria. Hmm. So if, if anyone wants to invest anything now, it's, it is still western part of Nigeria. But then now it, 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 all these things are changing. If you go to Lagos now, you know, or go to you know Ibadan, what you will find are people begging for arms. Okay, so how successful is this? How long do you think this will last? So the, we are, the, the recipe is actually there. <laughs> and, uh, you know, so if you've made uh, peaceful change impossible, then you would unfortunately make violent change inevitable, I'm afraid. Okay, we, we talk about their, their salary, their basic salary to be $2 million, right? But it's not just $2 million. They have things like housing allowance, they have hardship allowance, which is 50% of so many things. So there's so many things wrong there. And remember the yearly salary of Nigerian senator is 300, uh, 350, they convert the dollars to, to Naira, $353 million. Uh, that's a lot of money, 300. They probably earn about 30 million every month. So they earn about ten million. Uh, they 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 earn about a million every day. About ten million every exactly. day. And 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 they are not footballers, you know. Uh, they they are not superstars. <laughs> and they are earning this economic rent. So the the question you would then ask is, um, is Nigeria generating this kind of money? Oh. Okay. Uh, and then you see when you know monies are being generated. Uh, what societies do is to invest in the future. You don't just consume everything now. When Norway was in the same situation as Nigeria, getting petrodollars and so on, you know what they did? They simply set up what we call sovereign wealth fund, which you know I think I think Nigeria also has one. So they invest. They they, they set that up and they said, well. We will be investing in the whole world. We're going to be putting this money aside. I think that country has a population of 8 million, 8 million or so, 8 million. So they were investing everywhere in the world, such that, as at the last count, uh, when I did my PhD, 1.25 percentage of all the global shares are owned by Norway. Wow. So everywhere, everywhere in the world, they invest in shares, they invest in equities, they invest everywhere. So that one percentage, 1.25 percentage, it might be more now, of all the shares in the world are owned by Norway. Such that now they are saying that no Norwegian now or in the future can ever be poor. They've secured the life of the lives of uh, uh, their, their own children. And I, t I tell you, we had almost the same thing, a replica of that during the Western region. Uh, the, the government of Obafemi Olowo actually uh, was putting a little bit of tax on cocoa. And they were investing this. And they, what they said was that by 1970, they would have had so much funds in reserve that they would be able to send every citizen of Western Nigeria to university level, free of charge. So that, so that um, by 1980, we would have 100% literacy rate in Western Nigeria. That was the plan. <laughs> that was the plan. I mean, and you know, that, that plan unfortunately was truncated in 1966. We don't have such plans anymore. So um, what I'm trying to say here is that this, this is not sustainable. 2.16 million is not sustainable. If I am planting a tree now, I'm planting that tree, not because, uh, well, I may, of course, I, I may, I will still be around, but uh, trees may last, you know, would have a life expectancy of more than a human being. So I'm thinking about the future, I'm thinking about the future generations. So if you, if we are consuming this now, 
the question straight away is, do we even have the resources? The answer is no. The reason is why, the reason is this. Based on the budget, which was submitted, uh, I think, the 2021 budget, which was submitted, um, I think, last week or two weeks ago. Yeah, some few. Uh, showed that Nigeria would, it would have 7 trillion Naira deficit in 2021. That is if they generate that revenue that they're expecting, okay, and they, they spend that money based on the budget. Of course, you know that they will always overshoot the budget. Based on the budget, they are expecting 7 trillion Naira deficit. And what are the, the components of that 7 trillion de, uh, dollar deficit, Naira deficit? This recurrent expenditure. <laughs> This Google's expenditure. Those are the, that's the reason why we're in this debt. And you know, the effect is not on this generation alone. It will cascade into the future because <laughs> when um, they look for funding this, to, to fund this budget, they will have to borrow money. They will have to perhaps print more Naira. And printing more Naira, which is fiat money, will lead to uh, you know depreciation of the foreign exchange. That is, that is if they're not borrowing uh from outside of Nigeria. So this issue is that it is not, it is not, it is, it isn't um, sustainable. It is not something that can go on for a long time. It has to be addressed. So the, the way to go about it is to say that, look, this system isn't working. We're not achieving results uh, through this. Uh, and, and you see, your your guest in the morning has addressed this issue that look are we part do we see are we signatories to this constitution the answer is no so unfortunately again uh something would give it it, it isn't sustainable i'm afraid and what we're doing is that we're putting the future generation in more in more debt instead of building an empire like uh, uh norway is doing for its citizens Thank you very much, sir. I really appreciate your time. It is very good the way you are explaining things to me because it's making me to know and making uh, my audience to know what is going on in the country. Let's move to where we're supposed to start from. Foreign exchange policy is what you've mm. actually talked a little bit about. But should mm. we go deep inside more? Should we? Or should we go to the debt button? These are, these are a list of what we want to talk about, debt buttons. Population can't an effect on economy and financial planning. Uh, the issue of revenue allocation. Porous border with Niger, Chad, Cameroon. But the funniest thing is that the, the border with Benin Republic is not porous. It's well secured. <laughs> and the funniest thing is that we need to look at things and say, when you want to build school in England, you build mm. school in relation to how many children are born this year. So they now calculate what position, how many school space do they need in six years' time. But in Nigeria, they put all the schools in Kaduna. All the schools, 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 school, every school is in Kaduna. How many people live in Kaduna? How many people live in Lagos? And Okay, so, so let me, yeah, yeah, let, let, there are two issues there. There is the issue of population count. Uh, there is also the issue of uh, uh, policies that are fit for purpose or not fit for purpose. Um, you know, a very good example of a, a, a policy not fit for purpose is uh, mining uh, oil and gas in, in Port Harcourt and then piping them to Kaduna to, to refine. But in any case, let, let's start with the population count. Uh, sometimes I, I wonder whether um, the, the policymakers know the reason why uh, they do population count. Well, they do, they do. And that's why um, they, uh, they forge population count. The Nigerian constitution says that the constitution will be the basis for determining people who go into the House of Rep. Okay, so um, someone did uh, a, you know 
looked at, uh, did some data mining on the last population count, which was done during the time of Obasanjo. And they discovered that what was done was that they simply added the same percentage to the, uh, the one that was carried out hitherto, uh, maybe during the time of Babankida, and that was it. They simply just did that. And that is not, <laughs> that's not how to do population count. So which means that uh, they simply window dressing, okay? So the population count would, uh, would actually help us in addressing the issue of development, in planning, in you know determining how many hospitals do we need do we actually need to train more doctors if we cannot train them can we outsource can we get them from outside of the country uh, you see we, we can actually plan for the future but then what do we have you know we, we don't need to you know be labeled in on this area i've written on on this before um the, the, the population in nigeria is actually uh you know the figures being bandied around People question that 200 million, but I don't have a problem with that. But the component of that 200 million, you see, all over the world, look at the population of uh, countries all over the world. What you will find is that people settle in the coastal areas. That's the norm all over the world. Okay? Uh, it, 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 look at the United States. So say that, uh, um, you know, people will settle in the deserts, uh, in, in the in the hinterland, no, 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 that's not going to be that, that's that, that's not true. That doesn't happen. People settle in the coastal areas. I tell you, Nigeria is the only exception in the world where people don't settle in the coastal areas. Based on paper, yeah, you would find that in in arid in 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 in, in deserts, you know, in Sokoto, in Kano, uh, in in Katsina in Kaduna, in Maiduguri, that is where you have high population. And then you wonder, how can this happen? Well, I, I don't question the fact that they have a high procreation rate in those places. But then after procreation, where do the people go? That's the question. That's the question. So uh, do they remain in those places? No. Uh, the answer is no. They are, absolutely. They, they would go to where the economy is booming. And so that's why they come southwards. And, uh, you know, the people are now start, uh, they've now started questioning uh, the uh, unrestricted, unrestrained movement, whereby people come in, in, in large trucks being dumped in the southern part of Nigeria, because where, that's where the, uh, you know, the, the economy is booming. So the population count has always been fraught with um, irregularities. And, and of course, in, in recent times, um one of the you know colonial masters uh, one of the officers who came actually confessed that they forged the, the constitution and that which had been given to them at independence is exactly what they're still working on and i tell you we're not going to get anything different if they do the population count again there was a time when they said that the population of kano and lagos was the same they created a state out of kano and the old kano is still bigger than lagos state so uh, uh, then you wonder how is this possible and then people are coming from all over western part of nigeria eastern part of nigeria and they're you know converging in lagos and we do know that in reality the population of lagos is more than that of ghana so if the it is if we're doing doing the right population count i tell you 20 percent of the people in house of reps should actually be from lagos but are they going to allow that Unfortunately, that's not the case. So, but don't, just ignore the, you know, the the phone call; it's going to go off. So the, the so the population, unfortunately, uh, it, they will continue to forge that population. I'm afraid, uh, and that would. I can take it away from you so that we don't hear your voicemail. Yeah, just hold on for one second. Yeah. So, ladies and gentlemen, uh, my guest has just got a phone call, and I don't want you to interfere with his private life. He's gone now. Okay, let's go back to you there. <laughs> Continue, sir. Thank you. It's gone. It's gone. So, um, so as I've said, the population will always the, the the wrong population will always affect the policies in the future because uh, we're saying, oh, we need perhaps we need uh, more schools in Kaduna, more schools in Kano because you know that's where uh, the 
you know, the, 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 the population count is telling us that we need more people there. But are they actually going to build those schools? I doubt. See, the, you see, the, the, the issue of education is that I think it's a cultural issue. Uh, in 1976, Obasanjo came with the policy of universal primary education, 1977 rather. And the, the idea of universal primary education is that by 1983-84, we would have basic literacy in Nigeria. That is, everyone born would at least attain primary six education. Of course, by 1984, we had military rule, you know, the, the junta came and they abandoned that policy. Now, fast forward to 1999, we had again universal basic education, which the, the idea is, you know, uh, education up to JS3, that is the first nine years of education, would be born by the federal government, by the central government. Again, it, it, we're still having, you know, people uh, migrating all over the place, that is the Fulani people, uh, nomadic people. Are they actually going to school? Is this having any, any, any effect? Not at all. So even if they are, you know, arrogating high population to themselves. You know, is it leading to any development at all? They say they have more people. These people, uh, you know, population ought to be the greatest asset of, of, of any society. That is, I'm talking of people who are educated because you can actually, you know, you, you, you can actually export those skills. Like India is exporting its uh, IT professionals all over the world. They manufacture the best uh, banking softwares uh, in, in India. So, you know, educated ones will be your greatest asset. But what do we have in this case? These people are procreating, you know, and uh, they're not sending them to school. So, it, 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 and uh, as I've said, you know, the universal basic education hasn't had any effect. You know, we still have 15 million people or 16 million people out of school. <laughs> so, um, they, they own, they're only increasing the population or arrogating large numbers to themselves because of um, the, you know, how they share money, what, what you call revenue allocation. That's all. And even when they get this money, are they using it to build their human resources? Not at all. When this, pop, when this president came and said, well, he's, he's taking over, uh, uh, you know, petrol, uh, oil and gas, you know, he should have taken over, uh, you know, education so that he can, he can train his people and they can become the, the greatest asset. But, but that's not the case. Uh, it, it's a cultural issue, I'm afraid. So, um, unfortunately, as you know, the, the next population count, because I, I understand that the Bumbari is also interested in the population count. I'm afraid nothing good will come out of it. What you will find, uh, uh, and it's, you know, it's been very, um, uh, he, has, he has not been prevaricated on this issue. He is pro North. Oh, okay, he has yes. all the appointments from North. And he, the, the population count, we, we know what's going to come out of it. Not, nothing surprising. They, they, they're probably going to count the, the camels, the, the goats, the, the, the cow, mm. the well, even the bandits. They will count the bandits. That's what people say. <laughs> and the flies <laughs> in the north. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Uh, I, I can't thank you well enough. Let me just speak to the people at home quickly. Listen, gentlemen, thank you for staying with us since. I really appreciate you. We don't take you for granted. Please sign the petition. Uh, do the poll. Let's get this done because it's going to have a very big advantage on us. Without all these things, we cannot move easily to where we want to go to. We can't. If you think there's any other way, we need to actually find out ourselves and, and, and talk to ourselves in the language we understand. This is the easiest way we can do it. We want to give you the right information so that you know what is happening. More schools in the north than the south, and there's less people in the north than the south. More money being spent in the south in the north than the south. And they make less money in the north than the south. This is what we're doing. We generate the money in the, in the south. We give it to them in Abuja. And then when it gets to Abuja, they take a fraction of it and give it back to us to spend. And they embezzle the money and spend the money on foreign people. They don't spend money on their foreign. Yeah. That is why the governor of Cardinal said, said they gave some people one billion naira. 
in settlement for bringing them to Nigeria before 2015 election. And when they're not needed anymore, they, they tell them to bugger off. And the people say, we're not going to bugger off. We're going to start killing you guys. And they started killing us. And then it gets to a stage they negotiated. And they gave some money. They gave one billion naira to Meati Allah to give to all these bandits. And these bandits, they still took the money and they refused to go back. Whether they give them the money or Meati Allah actually kept the money, we don't know. That's another bad policy. So these are the things we're trying to rewrite all our wrong to right. So, ladies and gentlemen, you need to help me here. You need to help me to rewrite our wrong so that we can leave this contraction. There's no point in not staying there. Uh, once again, I want to thank uh, my guest today, Dr. Posi uh, Olatibosu, who has been feeding us and educating us uh, with all these information that we've been managing to grab out of him for some time. I, I cannot thank him enough. But there's still some few things we want to iron out more. The foreign debt that they were accumulating, the train they want to build from Kano to Niger Republic. <laughs> how, how is that going to help us? Oh, I, 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 wish, I wish all those things are not... I, I, wish, I wish I'm just reading them. I wish they are not... <laughs> Friction. Sure. They are true. Uh, that they're building um, train from Maradi to uh, Kano, and the yeah, and the argument is that well, um, they don't want them to take their cargo to to Kotonu, uh, to Ghana, and so on. But, but naturally, they will take. I mean, they, they've got natural advantage because Niger is all, just on, on top of Nigeria. But in any case, if there is going to be um, uh, that kind of venture. I think it would have made sense to link maybe Accra to Lume, to Bene, to, to Kotonu, to, to Lagos, I mean, because that, that would make more economic sense. And I think in terms of length, it is equivalent of uh, the Kano to Maradi. But that is, by the way, but let us look at how this ought to have been done. Say, there is no, we're living in modern times. And uh, the latest thinking is that this kind of issues are supposed to be handled by private operators and not by government. So what got the role of government here is to encourage this kind of things to happen and not for government to take, you know, to, to let this become their own business. So what I'm trying to say is this. Um, for instance, if, if government wants to build, you know, the, the bridge, uh, you know, the, the bridge from uh, Sabah to, uh, to nature, um, they, they, they can, you know, do this on, you know, PPP, so that it doesn't come into the government balance sheet. What I'm trying to say is this, if an operator, there, there are funds all over the world, as you know, there are private funds there. I mean, a very good example is the sovereign wealth funds that I'm talking about. <laughs> uh, as we speak, 17% uh, of the budget of Singapore is being funded through uh, sovereign wealth funds. That is, they've invested all over the world, and these returns are now representing 17% of their budget. But let us come back to uh, this debt. If, if all, government, all that government needs to do is to say, well, we want to do and then we're giving it to private operators we can license them to do it and that by 30 years or 50 years this will revert back to us okay so if they do so it is the private operators that will go and fetch this debt that would go and look for money whether it is their own equity or debt it is up to them but why is it that we're slowing things down you know by uh, government making sure that they borrow this money but that okay now let us now assume that okay well perhaps in this part of the world maybe it's going to be difficult because they, 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 there's insecurity and therefore nobody will, may want to invest here okay government wants to go ahead and uh, borrow this money after borrowing the money after building the railway they are going to be charging as they are charging now on Kano to Abuja uh, rail line they are charging less than market price so the, the question, therefore, is 
Are these loans pay, uh, repayable in the future? So what kind of debt is that? Okay, so what should happen is that, you know, assuming government are taking, you know, money to build that railway, they, they, you know, they, they can, you know, um, let private operators operate it and let people pay the market price. You, you cannot some, continue to subsidize that. I think I read something somewhere which says that they, they subsidize the, the Kano to Abuja to the rate of 50 million every month. Why is that? This is supposed to be paid for. Whoever is moving goods, uh, you know, pay for their goods. No, nobody subsidizes that kind of thing anywhere in the world. You know, you pay for it. Uh, and that's exactly what should have happened in petroleum and so on and so forth. So uh, those debts, and then there are some of them that doesn't make any sense. For instance, they want to borrow $500 million to rebuild NTA. That's why I say that, look, are we even supposed to be talking about this at all? Do, do these kind of things make sense? BBC that we have here is funded by taxpayers. That is, we pay £149.50 on a yearly basis to an independent body that funds BBC. And people are even now questioning the future of BBC. They're saying that the young ones are not watching BBC. So is it now that... Uh, you know, people are not interested in these issues that you're not investing in them. The same thing with our oil. By 2040, there will be an EU ban on fossil fuel. They're not going to be using diesel and petrol and so on and so forth in the EU region. And then we are still thinking about discovering oil in uh, in, in Maiduguri and all the places. So, so sometimes I shudder. I, mean, um, I think the only thing we can say is that, look, I mean, is that perhaps people who are running the affairs of the country are aware that this country will extinct at some point and therefore they need to steal as much money as possible because many of the things that they're borrowing money for to build, they're not going to be around in the future. Television was a great um, instrument, uh, means of, uh, you, know, uh, you know, disseminating information. But now, Look at, look at it now. We are not on actual television, what they call the box television. I'm actually talking to you on my Mac. <laughs> and then people are, have subscribed to this via YouTube. So things have changed. So now thinking about investing in NT to the tune of 500 million and uh, you know, building rail line. Imagine Nigeria building rail line from Kano to Maradi in, in Niger Republic. What economic benefit do you think that would accrue to the country? And as I've said, the same distance taking Lagos to Kotonou, and that would have benefited, that would have had immense um, you know, benefit on the economy of the, of the sub-region. So in summary, much of those debts are not sustainable. And unfortunately, it's going to put Nigeria in more poverty. Remember, before uh, General Obasanjo left in 2007, he had wiped this slate clean. You know, he had he had paid off all this debt. Now we are in more, more, you know, now than ever before, and it is now even unsustainable. See, by international reckoning, you forty uh, percent. You know, the, the the debts that you owe should not be more than 40% of the GDP. Now, the reason why they're, they're doing so is that um, uh, the, 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 the reason criteria is that um, it is believed that the, the tax, uh, you know, that there's a symbiotic relationship between tax receipts and GDP. But that's not even the case in Nigeria. You know, only 8% only of the you know, it, there's only 8% of the people pay taxes. 8% okay? So, so where we now have, you know, what we have now is actually unsustainable. And by next year, by the raise on the budget, they're saying that 75% of the budget will be paid in servicing debt. <laughs> so that, yeah, so the truth is, look, there is no Naira will depreciate next year. 
Okay, there's no mm. doubt about it because we now have more debt budget. Mm. So we have less money spent on development of the of the people because it is when you spend money on capital project that would uh, that will have multiply effect on the in the future. Yeah. Okay, that, that, that could lead to uh, the ability to generate even more funds. But that's not going to happen next year. S about 75% of the funds next year will be spent on debt servicing. So the, 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 the poverty is going to be much more grinding next year, I'm afraid. So okay. the, the question there is, how did we get here? Because they had a law in Nigeria which, which ought to guide uh, you know, this, this debt thing. But in any case, well, um, yeah, if you have, sorry, I think I have to stop there. Okay. The youths are doing what they're doing now. I think they're the, it's their future. And they are the only one that is standing in the way of a serious poverty for them 20 years down the line. Unless they continue doing this. And the good thing is that the church, the mosque, are joining in in this at the Jumat service at uh, the Toge, Lekki Toge today, they actually do the Jumat in the middle of the road. Uh, Redeem Camp, my body boy even came out to protest today, <laughs> which means there were sex stores are working hard to make sure that we don't we don't get overshadowed, drawn into this problem. The policies, which one and which one and which one? Give me three policies that they need to change urgently to avoid catastrophe. And on top of that one, tell me what is your take personally on this Nigerian Union? Your take personally on this Nigerian Union with all the things you know and tell me three policies that the youth needs to make sure they get, not promise, but get before they leave the street. Thank you very much. Now, in terms of um, the, the policies, um, I, I think we, the, where Nigeria is now, um, I think it's too late, really. Mm. Uh, it, 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 that's the truth, really. Because um, the you see um, the structure is absolutely wrong, and you know, uh, um, for a very long time, what has happened is that when we had people like Obasanjo, he was just to you know make sure that you know, we have a semblance of a union, and uh, you know he was serious about it. So. But but then, what what can what what are the, those three things you know the the youths can you know ask for now? Uh, um, I think the the, the what, what the best thing that they they should be asking for is for their representatives to see that this union called Naya comes to an end because. Uh, See, it is the situation, it is the, you know, how the Niger, Niger state is configured that actually led to where they are today. You know, they cannot go to school. And when they graduate from school, there is no job for them to do. And even if they get job to do, there is no security. And even the education they get is such that, you know, cannot make them to compete with their colleagues anywhere in the world. So, and, and you would have have noticed that you know our best hands are living in droves they're living you know that country in droves so one thing holds keys on for uh, uh, unfortunately fortunately unfortunately and that's the constitution of that country there is no way that that constitution can guarantee and you see you can see now that uh, you know when we had you know says in the, in the past they, they were just humane you know as bad as it was but now, you know, it is, that's in constitution, you know, that is operating, and then there's insecurity in the, in the country. So one thing that needs to change is 
that constitution needs to be brought down as soon as possible. I'm afraid if that is not done, Nigeria will continue to cascade. And no policies, you see, for instance, the, the police system all over the world, police are local. I've mentioned it before that you keep building barracks for the police. They're not soldiers. They are supposed to be living within the community. In fact, in some cases, you are not supposed to know whether your 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 neighbor is a police or a police woman. They're supposed to be living in the community. So and that constitution that gave them federal or, or central police, the constitution that gave um you know, 36 states, whereby we have six or eight states in Nigeria that are Yoruba-speaking states, and then you, you, you know, divided in, them into eight, such that they are replicating the same policy in the state, in Ogun state, and so on and so forth. So it is that that needs to change immediately. But, but as you know, that is not something that could change, you know, drastically. I'm afraid, you know, they would continue to, uh, to uh, you know, end, end SARS and so on and so on. But, but then it's not going to be very effective. What will be effective is, at best, let each of these regions become autonomous within Nigeria, and at worst, let that country bifurcate into six or whatever, like you good like like in Yugoslavia. I'm telling you in terms of policies, nothing. See, let me give you a, a instances. Look at budgets. Since this government came, they, they knew that budgets will be operationalized from January. And then they you know continually presented budgets uh towards the end of the year. Here in the UK, the 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 fiscal year runs from April to March, but then the budget is presented around September so that they would have six months to deliberate so that by March next year, the budget will be ready to be operationalized in April, okay? But, but then you cannot spend, even if that budget wasn't passed, you cannot spend a penny of the budget. But what do we have in Nigeria? Um, when the budget is presented, uh, you know, we have what we call provisional general warrants, which would enable the government to continually spend the spending of the year before. These were things that were done by the military government. So in, in U.S., that's not possible. You can see, uh, we've seen many times when the government shut down because, um, you know, the, the, the parliament refused to authorize budget. That's exactly what should happen, okay? But we have provisional have all sorts of warrants that enable government to continually function like it had done in the previous years. And you see, we've, we've had all sorts of uh, of policies, um, you know, spending 5,000 naira, you know, on, um, on unemployed people and so on. It hadn't worked. So I'm afraid there is no, there are no policies uh, that uh, could work in this kind of environment. Think about it. There are no foreign invest. Look, look, who is going to invest in Nigeria? Do you know that exactly the same thing that happened uh, uh, when Buhari was there in 1984 was exactly what's happening here? That was the time when we had foreign investments like uh, Kingsway, Leventis, living in Nigeria. The same thing is happening now. ShopRite is living. Others are living. Why is that? Because... Um, when you invest in Nigeria, by the time you're investing, Naira is depreciated. So, which means if tomorrow you want to pull out, you will get less than you yes. are invested. So, oh. who, which policies then? Now, think about foreign exchange. We had, we used, when um, Soludo was there, we had just one foreign exchange rate. Now we have 13. Okay. Um, foreign students. Uh, if you're buying goods from abroad, importers, if you're going to Mecca or whatever, uh, if, you know, brew the change, manufacturers, all sorts. You know, no economy functions that way. If I want to go to Greece tomorrow and I want to, I want to, uh, to buy, I can simply go to a cash machine. They can, I can go to the post office. <laughs> we have only one exchange rate. So, look, the the system. Is, look, all the bad things 
that had been corrected in the past was returned by this government. A very good example is the foreign exchange rate that I told you. Okay, um, the, so so the, the truth is um, the the system. You know, as we started today, that um, politics give birth to policies. So if the politics is wrong, unfortunately, there is no way in the world that that's going to give birth to good policies. It's not going to happen. So, and that's why, you know, in, in management, there is something we call, uh, well, it was Professor Porter who said that structure follows strategy. Structure follows structure strategy. Follows so, strategy, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Structure. So, if we now decided that, okay, well, you know what, the structure is okay, let's, let's just be praying and so on and so forth. You're not going to get anything out of it. it you know? It, so, if, if the politics is wrong. Unfortunately, of any policies that they can, you know, they, they, they can put into place. For instance, you see, talking about NSAS now, but well, what they actually ought to be talking about is let police be local. The, the, the police are saying that they're introducing what they call uh, community policing. Community policing is actually supposed to be what, see, policing is actually community-based. But then in, in, even within you know, our uh, police here, which is actually local, we have what's called community policing. But that community policing is actually like liaison between uh, the police and, and the people to, to continually let the surface uh, trust increase in trust, increase in stewardship, increase in accountability uh, with, with the police. That's what community policing is all about. Police originally, by its very nature, is supposed to be local, to be doing the bidding of the people. So I don't know of so when the they were true asking for answers, they would discover that uh, look what they should be asking for is local police. Well, as I, uh, I want to say that in terms of I, I don't know of any any immediate any changes in policy at the moment. These are the people who are going to implement these policies. Uh, no, 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 no. So, um, but but then. So, so um, it's not going to work. Now, in terms of Nigerian Union, you and I know that uh, there is now a big question mark on the future of that country. Look, that country is not, is not rich at the moment. We have more debts than income. Nobody respects, even in society, you know, nobody respects anybody who is in debt. Okay, so, so the integrity of that country, the big question mark on it now, because of that big debt overhang. So, so that so uh, which means that um, by the time by next year, when you see now fifty percent of the people are poor, next year it's going to be more because just twenty five percent of the budget will be spent. Okay, the country is not investing in the future. The oil, which is the mainstay of the economy, would no longer uh, be used within the EU region, and I'm very sure that. Uh, the same thing is being done in other regions. For instance, if you look at the uh, the master plan, the, the China plan, you you wouldn't find anything oil there. So they're investing massively, uh, you know, to circumvent the use of oil. So it's not only in the EU that by 2040 we're not going to be using oil in 20, just 20 years time. So and then we're not investing in. Um, in our youths. Now, I want to just make you, in, in answering this question about Nigerian Union, I want to talk about a model that we use in measuring performance. Uh, we call it balanced scorecard. You see, in balanced scorecard, we say that there is a link between um, the employees that you get, um, you know, how you motivate these employees, you know, how they, you know, how they innovate within the business, you know how to satisfy your customers, and that that leads to uh, more money. Which more means that if you, if you if you get uh, if you motivate your employees, it will help them to innovate. That innovation will lead to satisfaction of customers, or will draw customers to your organization. And then when you draw more customers to your organization, you get financial returns. So what I'm now trying to say in all this is that look at Nigeria now. We have 15 million people out, uh, people out of school. We're not investing in the future. 
um, the, the, the future of oil is almost non-existent. Nigeria it has a large debt overhang. So next year, it's going to be worse. Naira is going to depreciate, OK? So what do you think? So now we're, we're thinking about the future. So all this are happening now. So what do we now think would happen in 10 years' time? These people who are not in school, and that's going to increase next year, OK? Pupils are not in school. Uh, we're not giving qualitative um, education to uh, middle class, uh, to, 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 to the future of this country. People who are going to be, uh, who are going to be the mainstay, the manpower, who are going to manage this country in the future. So what do we think would happen in the future? Uh, you know, we know what the answer is, unfortunately. And let me say that. I hope you know that the same amount which had been, you know, the same amount which were being budgeted in 1983 is exactly the same amount which are still budgeting now. <laughs> you know, and then we've had population growth. The population has tripled since then. So the few, there is a big question mark on the future of that country. Uh, it would have made sense for there to be an orderly you know, bifurcation of the system. I remember in 1999, when Chief Olufalae said that um, people are asking for restructuring now, that a time would come when, when people talk of restructuring, nobody will be able to come out because there is guns everywhere. Everywhere is insecure. I remember that 1999. So anytime you're in, you're, you're interviewing him, please, uh, tell him this. He would remember this. That he said, nineteen uh, uh, that in the future, a time will come when, when you come for a torture and nobody's going to come out because everywhere is insecure. I think we're moving towards that now. Unfortunately, we're, so we're not moving, moving towards that. I think we're there already. Aha! So, so it depends. Hmm. Look, that uh, because look, part of the country has failed already. We have twelve state not operating Sharia, and I cannot live in, this, in that place. So the, the constitution, uh, you know, has become otios. You know, it's no longer operational the way it is. So um, what, therefore, we should be thinking about now is what should be the model for the bifurcation of this country? Do we want it to be uh, a seamless, you know, um, agreement where the North, the South, you know, the the elites would call their politicians and say, look, this thing is not working. Let's be patriotic. Let's go ourselves. Or it's going to be chaotic, like what happened in Yugoslavia or in Somalia. Uh, those are the things that we need to consider now. But then um, it will make sense for the Yoruba nation to start thinking about the future. Uh, what we need to be thinking about now is, well, if tomorrow we decide to leave, then we would become the 16th ECOWA state. What would be our relationship with uh, our US in, in Benin Republic and Togo? What would be our relationship with Northern Nigeria? What would be our relationship with Midwest uh, uh, and East? Uh, what would be our foreign policy? This is what we need. We need this is an academic exercise, and that ought to be happening now. Because the truth is this, that country is no longer fit for purpose. Now, remember, and I want to parallel between what happened in the United Kingdom and what's happening in the UK now, uh, in, in Nigeria now. In uh, uh, between 2000 and 2008, well, the, the, the locals here were barely tolerating the Eastern Europeans. But then by the time we had the financial crisis in 2008, People now said, hey, it is because of the Romanians that I'm no longer getting a job. Because I, people come to cut keys for £100 before they came. Now, uh, you know, they're cutting keys for £20. So they've taken my jobs away. So, and that loud voice continued to resonate until, uh, you know, the politician said, well, there are people who want in or out. And they got it. Now, that, that is the United Kingdom. Now, let's go to Nigeria. The economy is so bad now. As I've said, when I was young, in the days, you don't see a 
Yoruba man begging on the streets. Yeah. That has become the order of the day now. So people are now saying, look, we're worse off. Okay? And uh, it will happen. Okay? The elites in Yoruba, everyone is now talking about ship out. So the same thing that happened, which made you get to pull out of EU, had happened. The economy, people are poor, people are worse off. So, um, and, you know, no, that this is the topical issue today, the issue of the Nigerian Union. So what is likely to happen is that uh, perhaps the 2023 election may not even hold if some of the, you know, the regions of the country said that we're not, we're not going to go into the election. And even if somebody comes in 2023, there will be a question mark on the legitimacy of that person. So basically, there is a big question mark on the future of Nigeria because um, Nigeria consists of states. So those states yeah. are supposed to be independent or sub independent within Nigeria. So there's yeah. a question mark on the future of Nigeria, but I don't know where it will lead. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, sir. I really appreciate that. For for, uh, from you, sir. So, in essence, we, we haven't got much time to, to, to go on anymore, but there are some few things that are burning issue that I would like you to touch on before you go in relation to this protest, the protest that is currently ongoing. Where will it lead to? Hmm. They are That's at a dead end. Like you said, mm. they had a cut call the sack. That's what yes. you call it, sir. So, mm. what do you think is going to happen? Where do you think it's going to go? What can they do to stop it from becoming, I don't know, uh, another Rwanda coming? We have information today that they're taking advantage of bringing more ammunition to Nigeria. Are we breeding another Rwanda in our hand? Is it going to turn to another Mogadishu? What's your take on this? Hmm. Um, thank you very much. You see, this protest actually brought out the fault lines in uh, the so-called uh, Republic of Nigeria. Uh, for instance, you can map out you know, people who, who are protesting uh, against um, uh, SARS. They're basically in the southern part of Nigeria. Okay. Um, I listened to an interview with uh, uh, Mr. Farut, I think Farutini last week, a, a lawyer who said that between Lagos and Jeba, there are 40 checkpoints, 40 um, um, customs checkpoints, and that between Jeba and Katina, not one um, customs checkpoint. Think about that. Okay, not one customs checkpoint between Jeba and Katina, but then forty between Lagos and uh, and Jeba. That tells you that the country isn't one. So NSAS is actually, you know, helping to, um, pro, you know, make clear that fault line uh, within that country. That look, you know, you want to end SARS because SARS is so troubling you in the southern part of Nigeria, but it's not troubling us here in the northern part of Nigeria. You know, based on the, I mean, you can thank you for that map that you showed on the screen just now. Where is this going to lead to? Thank you. Yeah, that's the map. Yeah, you can see keep SARS in the in, in the upper part, and then we have end SARS. You see, in the 12 Sharia states, yeah, they, they, they want SARS because they, they actually don't have, you know, SARS operating there. So when you when you talk about NSAS, they, they, they don't know what you're talking about. And that's why they're saying keep SARS. Okay. So, um, so that, um, that tells you that the constitution actually is otios. It's actually not working. Event had overtaken that constitution. Actually, what should have happened is that, you know, people should have, uh, you know, if they were responsible enough, I'm talking of uh, the managers of uh, the country, they should have, you know, quickly, you know, nip this in the board. It, it, it's like um, when the issue of um, gay marriage came up here, okay, they, they quickly, you know, came in to say, well, 
it's actually uh, something that wasn't thought about, but you know, it, it will go against the spirit of equality and diversity, and therefore we would have to imbibe this. So that's what they should have done. So where will this lead to? What's likely to again happen is after this, there may be another protest. For instance, look at the issue of, uh, you know, uh, there, there was a time when they invited, I think, the governor of Kaduna State to NBA, and that led to bifurcation of NBA. So MSAS is actually telling us that the country isn't one. What's likely to happen again is that there will be another issue, and there will be takes on that issue. There will be take of the Southern Nigerians, take of Northern Nigerians. And this may continue to go on like that until something gives. Remember that there is grinding poverty. Uh, opportunities are shrinking, okay? Um, the uh, the managers of the economy, they're not inventing new monies. That is, they're not creating jobs and so on and so forth. So, and then we have a, a frail president. Now, th there are so many variables here. Uh, so, if, if this gets out of hand, um, there may be you know, we may have a situation where, um, you know, if, if there is you know, incessant killings, for instance, or the army is forced to take over, uh, they may actually take over power. And if they take over power, that, you know, uh, that's one of the things that could happen. They may actually take over power. And if they take over power, it's going to set us back seriously. Okay. And remember, if this is what we have now is unlike the 1983 or 1966 event are no longer you know the same the variables are not the same okay uh, but in the meantime you know before that would happen what's likely to continue continue to happen is that the fault lines would continue to be pronounced okay so there will be issues and there will be take of the northern nigeria the sharia 12 states there will be take of the southern part of nigeria until uh, it becomes, um, you know, it, well, it's a political issue, but it's been driven under the ground. But it will become pronounced such that maybe some, some people would take the bull by the horn and say, look, maybe we need to take a referendum now. For instance, there is that uh, being considered in the six states of the southwestern Nigeria. Okay, so other, other states may, con may consider... Uh, the fact that they are not safe in this country, and that would lead to that will ultimately lead to either you know uh, the bifurcation of the country, or you know sitting down, you know deliberately sitting down to make sure that the, the place is restructured. But in the meantime, in the, the short run, in the short run, what's likely to happen is that there will be another protest, there will be other issues which would continually show that that country isn't one. Okay, and uh, ultimately, uh, it will lead to the bifurcation. But but we pray that the bifurcation will be a peaceful one that they would see sense in coming to the round table and uh, you know us finding a middle middle table in all of this. Because I could say that if this continues until twenty twenty three, I don't see Buhari handing over. He may hand over to uh, Buratai. The, the way it is because he is keeping that guy that guy is supposed to be retired so he may be keeping him there for a reason okay but i don't see him uh the, the way it's going uh, you know because if he uh hands over to a southerner perhaps all these policies of northernization fullernization may be reversed but is nigeria even would nigerians even be patient enough to you know for anything like this to happen i think um the uh what may happen in the long run is that he may hand over to a military but between now and 2023 um i think we may have you know we may have other events which would uh show that uh, nigeria isn't one thank you very much for that thank you for your very full informative exercise yeah before we go i would like to reiterate one thing even if they want to hand over to military, if Buratai wants to take over, this is an uprising. I am telling you that now. We're part of the stage. 
And I think we have about less than six weeks left before the country, Nigeria, will be no more. I'm telling you the fact now, and I want you to know. So this is what's going to happen, right? I want to say a very big thank you for coming with me today because we have gotten to the end of this program. But there's still more to talk about. And we haven't actually finished discussing everything we want to talk about. So what I will probably do is bring you back another day. You might oh, have yes. to become a regular one now, especially when it comes to the economy and financing and policy making and drawing, because you seem to have a wealth of experience. Uh, it is not only people in politics that can make policy. The people that knows about it are the one that needs to make policy. Because if the people in, in politics make policies, uh, policy, policy, they end up making stupid policy, which from experience we have found out, right? Uh, competent managers uh, are the ones that can make policies. Competent administrator are the ones that can make the right policy. Because I don't think Baba Awolowo is actually a, a, a politician. I think he's a very good administrator. That is what I think. And with sad mind and with every mind, I would like to share this information with you guys. With a very, very, very every mind, I announced to you guys someone that just left us this morning. Uh, is a well-to-know person and the person is actually very, very related to the gentleman. I've just mentioned his name. Uh, 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 let me just get, get it on the wire properly because I, it's just turned up on the wire just now and I want to make sure I read it precisely to our viewers so that I don't get them confused with the right information. I want to make sure it's only the right information that we pass out. Farewell to Mrs. Tola Oyedira, uh, a member of the Afeni Ferry, uh, the eldest surviving child of our leader, Chief of Bafemi Awolowo, who sadly passed away this morning. She will have been 80 on the 1st of November, but uh, death broke into her house early hour of this morning and was taken without any illness. Mrs. Oyejion was a lovely person who radiated warm and love to all in her lifetime. A death is a big blow we have to accept as we cannot change the will of Almighty God. We can only pray for God to take good care of the family she left behind. External response, uh, the post, we pray for our soul. And uh, I would like to console my, 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 I don't call her sister. A lot of you call her sister, but I don't think she's my sister. I think she's my mother. Uh, Mrs. Dosumo Awolowo, sister, to, uh, no. mother Tokumbo. I would like to send a, a big condolence, condolence to her from everybody at Heritage Television because she's a regular and a special advisor to us there. She will come and say, why did you do that program? You're not supposed to do that program like that. Don't look for trouble. Always look for peace. Don't look for that. She always advised. She's always there at the front front of things. And if things need to be changed, she will call us and tell us things. So she's not a sister, but she is a mother. Uh, I hope you're listening. I'm sure you're listening. Uh, um, Chief Mrs. Tokumbo Dosumo, I will lower a condolence to you there. Thank you very much. Dr. Posi Ola Chuboso, I want to say a very big thank you to you. Uh, and it's been a fantastic time hearing from somebody who knows how to put the right policy in place. <laughs> Not your policy, but the right policies. They are policies and they are policies. And they go hand in hand. Like there's fraudulent, there's Fulani, there's Fulanization, and uh, <laughs> all this F goes with them. I want to say a very big thank you on behalf of my listeners, our listener. Uh, do you see to our bank? Oh, someone just asked a question. What do you see to our banking system, sir? Well, that, that, that's a big question. I don't even know where to start. But, but, let, let, but because of her time, let me just quickly say that. Wrap it up with it. That, um, yeah, yeah. Wrap it up okay. quickly. We've got two minutes. Um, thank you. Okay. See, so the, the, uh, the last governor of this, well, the two governors that we now, we have, uh, we had um, 
Soludo. He had great plans for the banking system. And uh, his plan was that um, the foreign exchange, uh, the, the foreign reserves, it should, should actually be managed by Nigerian banks. And uh, see, and this is something that we'll have to trash uh, out in the future. How, does it make sense for Nigeria, his sovereign state, to keep its own savings in London? Uh, is South Africa doing the same? Surely not. So, well, this guy wanted to do so. And at some point, he had started that program that 10% of the foreign reserves would be managed, and ultimately, all the reserves would be managed by Nigerian banks. And then what happened when a Fulani man came? He abandoned that policy. He said they should return, you know, to status quo. So, look, it, it's, I think also the U United Kingdom is benefiting from the current worked structure that Nigeria has got. So, um, so what we have now, uh, the, the banks in, in Nigeria are benefiting from the foreign exchange, you know, the warped foreign exchange system because they are round tripping. And that round tripping is not going to pay anybody. It's not working for the ordinary man on the street. Um, so, uh, and, and that banking system is actually supposed to be engine of growth. But um, it's not so because of what I've just told you now. But I will elaborate on that in future. Nigeria's savings is not within Nigeria, unfortunately. It is benefiting another economy. Fantastic. Thank you very much for that. I hope that answers your question. Thank you once more. Uh, please like the page, subscribe to it, make sure you press the bell button, the bell sign, so that you can know when we are online because most of our program, we don't announce it beforehand. The reason being that we don't want it to be truncated. Because some people will try and do anything to make sure you don't hear our information. So you will only know about it about a few 20 minutes, 30 minutes before the program. Apart from that, you're not going to hear anything. I want to say a very thank you to my guest. I want to say a very big thank you to Samuel Dada, who has been typing. Temi Tokwe, uh, Shueba, Josiah, uh, and all the people at Kintola, Matthew, Ademola, uh, Uluwasu, Shegu, Henry, uh, and the old uh, Don Flash, and they call her Shule, who was with Joe, Joe, or Joe Joel, Akobi Odudua, wow, and Nigeria now, the man says. And that's the people on Facebook, all the people on YouTube. This one has been there all day long. David Adego, okay, you started and you're still there. I can't believe you are a faithful follower. Please. Make sure you subscribe, hit the like button, and hit the subscribe button as well. So that, that way, this way, encourage us to keep bringing this kind of program to us. And someone has just asked for somebody, and I will fight tooth and nail to make sure that God on my side, I deliver the person you're asking for. Uh, it won't be this weekend because the weekend is so full up. But very early next week, you will have this gentleman on the... Screen with me. Uh, uh, da, da, uh, no, where, where, where is the name again? Uh, one second. Where is the message again? Where is the message? The message is running away from me. But the message is lying. It can Mr. Dili Faru Timi is going to be here with me sometime next week. I haven't contacted him, but I'm sure I will find him for you. Uh, I think my guest is telling me he's going to bring him. Yeah? You can, you're going to link me up with him? That's great. <laughs> so that's good. <laughs> and we have him here before the end of next week. No matter what he does, he will create time for his nation. This man that speaks the truth, I want to speak the truth and the truth and nothing but the truth. So this is my assignment. Everything you want, you know, I said to you last week, ask and it shall be given. So you just ask for this one. It's the same thing that happened when you asked for uh, Professor Moyo Okediji. Within two days, it happens. And I'm sure... Uh, the our assessor will make this one happen so quickly as well. I would like to say thank you one more time to all of you who has made this program a wonderful program. Remember, uh, when we finish the program, the program is going to be available on YouTube, Instagram, uh, not, not Instagram, but tomorrow, the, 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 the protest or the rally, whatever you want to call it, I don't call it anything like that. I call it something more than that. We'll be here live from about... 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock in the morning till about 5, 6 o'clock in the evening. I will be there myself with somebody interviewing and speaking to a lot of people. So it's an eventful day tomorrow and Sunday. 
for us today. I would like to say a very big thank you to you. And on this note, I will be calling a day with you all. Hope to see you later on in this evening. I think the next program is about 8 o'clock. God bless you all and goodbye, sir. Gentlemen, the national anthem of the newly formed Uduwa Nation. Yeah.